I was reading on a news report uh, just this afternoon, the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University, which is led by George Barna, who um, tracks all kinds of surveys that deal with churches and Christianity. This is really interesting and sad. At the same time, pre-COVID area, 6% of Americans that were Christian only 6% had a biblical worldview. After COVID and people were locked up, churches were locked down, it has dropped a third of that, 4%. Uh, Everyone became less biblical in their understanding of a biblical worldview. But the uh, population most damaged were the born-again Christians. George Barna says this. Here's what he said. He said, this is how societies collapse. We need revival. Here's what his study said. When you put the data in perspective, the biblical worldview is shuffling toward the edge of the cliff. And uh, he says, as things stand today, biblical theism is much closer to extinction in America uh, that it has been in the nation. The current incident of adults with the biblical worldview is um, uh, the early 90s when it was much better. The veteran researcher cautioned young people in particular are largely uh, a society uh, that's the most aggressive at rejecting biblical principles. Barna was especially disappointed that more Christian churches and schools are not emphasizing a biblical worldview development. He says people do not develop a biblical worldview randomly or by default. The impact of arts and entertainment, government, public schools is clearly apparent in the shift away from biblical perspectives to a more experiential and emotional form of decision making. It's pretty frightening in it. We see that's the way that Europe went in years past. Tonight I want to share before I begin once again in chapter 20 in verse 11. Last Wednesday evening after Bible study, Brett came up and uh, Brett Lovett came up and asked me a question. And I'm always grateful for the questions I know people have been listening, and Brett came up to ask a question that I really intended to include last uh, Sunday evening, and I uh, failed to do that, and I want to uh, do that tonight. Brett said, so the purpose of the millennial kingdom, uh, of Satan being bound, of Satan being released, uh, at the end of that is for the purpose of And it is for sure to show you and me that Satan bound for a thousand years, when released, Satan is still Satan. Satan has not changed one iota. It's also to show that those that are born during that thousand years will have to choose whether they follow Satan when he is released or will they turn to Christ uh, and be saved for all eternity. So those are two for sure reasons of showing that in that millennial, that thousand year reign of time, when there is pretty much peace on earth and uh, Christ will be ruling the nations with the rod of iron, In other words, sin will not be running rampant and lawlessness as it is in the day that you and I are presently living in. Tonight, as we look at verse 11 and following, we won't get too far tonight, but judgment at the throne of God in verse 11, John said, then I saw a great white throne 
and him who sat upon it. And notice the phrase, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. He goes on and he said in verse 12, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books. Notice the plural of that. According to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. Remember Hades, the realm of the dead? And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, when you look upon verse 11, then I saw a great white throne. Remember, the judgment seat of Christ is for the Christians. It's not whether you're saved or lost there, because if you're at the judgment seat of Christ after the rapture, then you are saved. But you will be judged according to what you did with your life for Christ from the moment that you got saved until you enter into the presence of God. We will be judged according to what we did for him, the works that we've done. Will those works be for all the right reasons? If so, we'll be rewarded. If they were done for all the wrong reasons, wood, hay, and stubble, they'll be burned up. But the person's salvation will be saved. That person will be saved as through fire. Then when you come to chapter 11, I mean 20, we see a great white throne judgment. This is at the end of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. This is for all of the lost dead since Adam. All of the lost of all of the ages, they're at the great white throne judgment. This will be a judgment whereby he's got books that are going to be opened and they're going to be judged by their deeds. You see, a lot of people think they can get to heaven by their good deeds. They don't think they need anything else. But according to God's word, they're going to be judged out of the books that their deeds are recorded in. And there is absolutely no deed that they will have done that will make them be able to inherit eternal salvation in heaven for all eternity. If you wind up at the great white throne judgment, you are lost forever and ever and ever and ever. Now when the, well, one other thing in verse 11, then I saw a great white throne in him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. Now notice, Jesus has been given authority. He will be the great judge. Now this says that, that heaven and earth fled away. Most every Bible commentator that I have uh, read about this particular uh, verse speaks about that this great white throne judgment will be somewhere suspended between heaven and earth. Because he says, uh, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. If earth and heaven fled away, then obviously this is going to take place somewhere above where the earth is. It says, and no place was found for them. 
John said in verse 12, he said, and I saw the dead, great and the small. Notice here, both those that have been famous through the years, those that are wealthy, rich through the years that did not need Christ, the great, the small, those known, those unknown in this world. They're standing before the throne, if you can only imagine, and books were open. Theodore Epp, who was a, a great Baptist minister, he wrote a full book on the book of Revelation. He said, when the books are opened, even the sins of the mind will be exposed some say, I've never committed murder, but the Bible says, whoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath ever hath eternal life abiding in him. First John chapter 3, verse 15, some say, I've never committed adultery, but the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5, verse 28, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Epp says such things will all be recorded in the books that are opened at the great white throne judgment. There will be no escape. None will be able to deny their sins which are written in God's perfect record. He says, unbelievers will also be judged according to the gospel. The apostle Paul referred to the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Paul wrote that to the Roman church in Romans 2.16. Now what is this gospel Paul preached? The gospel he preached is the same gospel the good news that is preached today throughout the world. That word gospel means good news. And the gospel is the good news that John 3, 16, let's say it together, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now the gospel is the good news that he that believeth on him is not condemned, John 3, 18 says. Let me tell you, that's why the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who be in Christ. For we pass from death unto life. And uh, unbelievers are going to be judged according to gospel, not according to how they lived while they were on earth. They will be condemned because they've refused God's wonderful gift of grace, his provision for their salvation. Now, a few moments ago when I mentioned what George Barna had discovered uh, post-COVID, how that only 4% of uh, American Christians have a biblical worldview. Is it not understandable why we're seeing all that we have seen in past days in our nation that is so anti-biblical, that is so anti-against God's commandments? Now, among those, and, and I don't get this, I don't understand this, but according to that, there are Christians who do not have a biblical world view. Now that's hard for me to, to uh, savvy in my finite mind. But I suppose that there are lots of people out there that profess to be Christian, that they've received God's gift of grace, but they don't have a biblical world view. Their world view is lining up with What's going on in the world today and the culture? Now, I don't understand that. It's the only way that I probably would be able to understand that would be because there will be those who will stand before Christ at the judgment seat for the saved in heaven after the rapture. 
that their works will be burned up. They were all for the wrong reasons. And you and I are living in a day that is incredibly challenging. Let me tell you, it's also apparent that there are going to be different degrees of judgment for unbelievers. Now, please hear this out. A lot of people think that everybody's going to have the same rewards in heaven. Not so. Everybody thinks that everybody in hell is going to be, have the very same judgment. Well, judgment is for as far as according to be lost. But it's apparent there will be different degrees of judgment for those who are lost. This will not be in length of punishment, for they will forever be eternally separated, but in the severity of their punishment. All the punishment is going to be eternal. Now, <clears throat> twice the Apostle John emphasizes they are judged according to their works, verses 12 and 13. Now, the question often comes up, what's going to happen to the person who has not had all of the information of the gospel? Will that individual be judged as severely as other persons? Theodore Epp says in his commentary on that, it's important, uh, he says it's important to, uh, to realize about these judgments the severity of the way we lived our lives even as unbelievers. So, because those who refuse Jesus, they're already condemned, this great white throne judgment will actually be the execution of of the sentence that's already passed against them. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, and if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I've spoken, the same shall judge him in that day, John chapter 12, verse 47 and 48. You see, the word of Christ is the basis for judgment. So at the great white throne judgment, he brings out the books, and the books are opened, and another book is opened, and in that book, it's the book of life for those that are saved. And the dead are judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works, Revelation 20, 12. Now, Epp says this. He said, I believe the scriptures teach that the moment a person is born into the world, his name is written in the book of life. However, if by the time of that person's death, he has not received Jesus Christ as his Savior, then his name is blotted out of this book leaving a great vacant spot where the name once was. And at the great white throne, the book of life is brought forth only to prove to the unbelievers that their names are not there. They've been removed because of the rejection of Jesus Christ to the very end of their lives. Now, uh, Dr. Theodore Elp, he says he believed that, teach, uh, that Scripture teaches that. Back in ancient days, in ancient cities, they would have a city registry. It would be of all of the citizens that lived in that particular city. <clears throat> if they did anything to, uh, that was so bad that they were brought in judgment over or are ostracized and kicked out of the city, their name would be blotted out of the city registry. Dr. Epp says, the word of God is clear, that he that cover his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsake of them shall have mercy. And so, these books are opened. 
Now, the question, what happens to people that have never, ever had the gospel and all of the information of the gospel like other people throughout the world? And by the way, uh, for those of you that remember when we had the little African children's choir a few years back, I have booked them again for September Sunday morning, September the 10th. They're coming uh, back to the United States and they're going to be in various churches. And I told them I wanted them on a Sunday morning. We had to do it on a Sunday morning. And so they've worked it out that they're going to be here on a Sunday morning. And uh, so... Um, I'm going to be asking in the days to come, I'll need 12 or 13 families that will sponsor a couple of those kids to spend the night on Saturday night uh, before they leave to go back to Dallas and fly back to Africa. And so uh, be thinking about that, praying about that. If you would like to be a host home for a couple of them and a sponsor. Well, <clears throat> keep in mind as these books are open, God is the righteous judge he will not judge unfairly. And the degrees of judgment, <clears throat> Dr. Epps says, will be based on knowledge regarding how God judges those with varying degrees of knowledge. Remember what Paul said, for there is no respect of persons with God, for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law, Romans 2, 11 and 12. Degrees of judgment are also seen in the words of Jesus when he said this, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, get this, Jesus said, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Matthew chapter 11, verse 21 through 23. And then also Luke chapter 12, verse 47 and 48, indicates degrees of punishment in hell. Notice in the book of Luke chapter 12, verse 47 and 8, and that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. And then Christ also indicated that some would receive more severe punishment or more severe judgment than others when he said in Luke chapter 20, verses 46 and 47, beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers, the same shall receive greater damnation. Now, Jesus said that. So, when you think about people, one of these days, when they are sent to their eternal place of torment for all eternity, those who have less enlightenment of the Holy Scriptures that reject Christ will be less 
severe in the punishment in eternity than those who have committed great crimes and great uh, lawless acts and deeds down through the years. Now, I know a lot of people have a hard time believing and understanding that when I get to heaven, there are going to be degrees of uh, rewards. Yes, I believe that the Bible teaches that. I believe Jesus taught that in some of the parables, the stories that he told. A parable is an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. And then from these scriptures tonight, where Paul and where Jesus himself has spoken about the severity of the degrees of punishment. I believe there will be people that will have great responsibilities, greater responsibilities than others in the new Jerusalem and in the new heaven and the new earth one of these days. I believe there will be degrees of severity of punishment for those that are eternally separated in hellfire and brimstone, as the Bible says. I heard someone say the other day on the radio, that stuff about hellfire and brimstone don't cut it anymore. I just thought about, well, sister, God's laughing at you from above. The Bible says he sits in the heavens and he laughs. Let me tell you, it does cut it. And let me tell you, one of these days when he separates the sheep from the goats, they will know it then. Let's talk about the judgment at the great white throne. It will be the second death. For those judged will be cast where? Into the lake of fire. And as a result of this second death, these shall be punished. Notice with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Paul wrote that to the church at Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 9. In other words, it's going to be an eternal separation from God in a literal hell of torment. The punishment is of divine origin for it's God who inflicts it. Jesus himself said in Luke 12, 5, I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. You see, that judgment belongs to the Lord. It's also seen in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 30 and 31. Hebrews 10, 30 and 31. For we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And let me say this, for those who think that God is only a God of love and not a God of wrath, let me tell you, Hebrews 12, 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire. Revelation chapter 20 concludes by saying, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Get the picture. The tribulation will begin somewhere after the rapture of the church. The next event in biblical prophecy I believe, will be the rapture of the church. I believe that the church will be taken out of here. I believe because he will keep us, E-K, the Greek term from, out of, from, the hour of temptation that's going to come upon the world. In Revelation chapter 4, when John said, I saw heaven opened, the door was open, and and John has extended the invitation, come up here. That's where those of us who believe in the pre-millennial, pre means before the thousand years reign on the earth, the pre-millennial view that believes the church will be raptured out of here before the tribulation period begins. So if you want to know where we get that, it's in Revelation chapter 4 
When John says heaven was opened, that a door was opened, and, and a voice said, come up here. And then in chapter 6 and following, we see all of the terrible things that happen. The seal judgments. There are seven of them. When the seventh seal opens, then the trumpet judgments begin. When the seventh trumpet judgment opens, then the bowl judgment or the vile, the I-A-L, vile judgments begin upon the earth. What are these? There's going to be all kinds of things, war, bloodshed, pestilence, diseases, the beast of the field, uh, cataclysmic events out of the cosmos up there, out of the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars. All of these different things that are going to take place upon the earth, the bottomless pit open and, and these locusts come out uh, to torment men for five months for those that have taken the mark of the beast will be tormented and punished with a, a sting, a pain that will be unbearable. And they will want to die, but die according to the Bible. Death will flee from them. So from chapter 6 all the way through chapter 19, the church isn't even mentioned or talked about. There's another reason why the premillennial view believes the church will be raptured before the tribulation begins. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, during the middle of that, remember the Antichrist breaks his peace treaty with the nation of Israel. They're allowed to rebuild their temple. And they're allowed to uh, begin their worship uh, during the first part of the seven-year tribulation. He makes a covenant. He confirms a covenant with them. They begin to build their temple. They've got everything already right now, tonight. It's already in place. They've made all of the, the uh, regalia that they're going to wear, the robes and all of those things. The furnishings have all been made all of that has been done by the Temple Institute. We looked at a video, if you will remember one Wednesday night, about the red heifers that are spotless. Now they supposedly found those down in Texas from some farmers down there. They flew them back to Israel. They think that they uh, will be uh, the ones that are used because they have to be, their ashes have to be used uh, to ceremonially cleanse themselves and the temple of all sin. And so when the seven, in the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist, the world dictator, he uh, breaks his covenant, all unleashes all hell upon the earth. He will be Satan incarnate. Satan will absolutely fill him, inhabit him with all kinds of powers, signs, wonders. He will... Uh, uh, he will uh, put the, uh, the uh, false uh, prophet, the one who heads up the one world religion, he will be cast aside and he will, the Antichrist will set himself up, his image to be worshipped and all of those that do not take his mark, uh, the mark of the beast, if you don't have that you can't buy, you can't sell, you can see where many people will starve to death of starvation the gospel will be being preached, 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 12,000 each from the 12 tribes of Israel will be. God will have those two witnesses. Remember, they, get, uh, they are killed, murdered in the street. Their bodies lay in the city of Jerusalem. The whole world will see it. Technology up there, 6,000 or more uh, satellites that are orbiting this world tonight. Up there in space, people will be able to see what's going on. The, people's, the, the Bible says that people are going to rejoice when those two witnesses are killed. Will it be Enoch and Elijah? Will it be Elijah and Moses? Will it be somebody else? God knows. And that's really all that matters. They'll lie in the streets. Their bodies will lie in the streets. The Bible says that people will rejoice. 
They'll be so excited, it'll be like Christmas. They'll send gifts to each other, rejoicing over their death. After three and a half days, life comes into those bodies. They stand up, they are resurrected into heaven in the midst of all of those people in a cloud. And so, the gospel will be preached throughout the tribulation. Many will be saved. Many will be martyred for their faith. That's why we're told, I believe in chapter 5, where the martyrs cry out under the altar, How long, O Lord? How long, O despote, O sovereign Lord? How long before you vindicate those who have perpetrated this upon us? And they're told, they're given robes, remember? They're told to rest a little while. And I think that's interesting if they're given robes, don't you? I've never seen a spirit with a robe on it. But I, I'm confident of this. The great God I serve, he can do anything. So I'm not worried about how all that operates. At the end of the tribulation, a great battle takes place at Megiddo, there in the valley of Estralon. 200 mile long valley, 100 mile wide, perfect for war time. The, the nations will gather there to fight against the nation of Israel. And all of a sudden, heaven will open, and the King of kings and the Lord of lords coming out on a conquering white horse as the victor. All of the saints of heaven will be coming with him, the angels of heaven. It says the armies of heaven, which include the Christians, which include the angels coming with Jesus. The Bible says he'll smite them with the sword of his mouth. He'll speak the word. Let me tell you, they'll turn to try to fight him, but he smites them with the sword of his mouth, the spoken word. And the first two that are nabbed up to be cast into the lake of fire will be the Antichrist and the false prophet who headed up a world false apostate religion which will be an amalgamation of all religions throughout the world, the mysticisms and all of the cultic religions and, and a, a, a dab of this one and a dab of that one. And, and many peoples of the world will be so deceived, deceived because they will fall for it. The Bible says then we're going into this thousand-year reign of Christ. We looked at that last Sunday night pretty extensively about what that's going to look like, what that's going to entail as much as we understand. Let me tell you, a lot of people say, I don't read the Bible because I don't understand the Bible. Well, you know, there's a lot of things in the Bible we're not, we're not given to understand. It would be just like if uh, you took a physics teacher who would try to teach a two-year-old that's not a child prodigy, let me throw that in there, to take a two-year-old and teach them quantum mechanics. It's not that the teacher can't teach it, it's just the two-year-old can't learn it. Their mind can't conceive it, their mind can't comprehend it. And there are things in the Bible you and I cannot conceive and comprehend. God doesn't expect us to understand everything that there is, or I don't think it would have been included in the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God. There are just some things that are secret that he's not going to reveal to us. You know why? Because we would be like the two-year-old, and he would be like the quantum physics teacher teaching us something that our minds could not conceive or understand. And so, the incredible thing that's going to take place in this world, verse 15, and I'm closing, chapter 20. Well, let's, let's go back to 13 real quickly. And the sea gave up the dead. Somebody called me the other day and said, Pastor, what do you think about cremation? I said, I'm all for it cost too much to be buried we bury millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in those cemeteries 
Hello, I've done it too with my family members. The caskets, the vaults, the tombstones. By the way, I hope yours didn't get damaged in the tornado the other day. Some of them did. But somebody said, what do you think about it? I said, well, it's either ashes or dust. You choose. The Bible says we're going back to the dust, doesn't it? From whence we came. So I'm not worried about dust or ashes. If he can create this body and record our days before he ever, we ever, our substance ever was, then I'm not concerned about how all that takes place. Verse 13 said, and the sea gave up the dead. I was listening on television the other night. I believe it was on National Geographic, the History Channel, one of those. They were talking about how many shipwrecks there have been in the oceans of the world, the seas of the world. It's unbelievable. I think they've only discovered about 5% of all of the, the uh, sea accidents in all the world. They were showing one the other night where they had found $505 million worth of gold and silver coins. I think that belonged to the Spanish. But the interesting thing is all of those people that have died at sea, those bodies aren't still out there in the ocean like you and I would comprehend that. I mean, whales, sharks. Must I go further? Uh, I don't even want to think about that. I want a sandwich here in a little bit. Uh, but the sea, it says, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. What's he referring to there? The place of the dead, the realm of the dead, where the lost dead are in whatever that compartment is. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Now, here's the deal. If you could get to heaven by your works, and the deeds that you have done, I can assure you, you cannot. It's recorded right here. The books were opened. You see, they didn't receive Christ. So they think they've got a chance. The problem is the greatest works they could ever do would never be enough to merit salvation. Verse 14 said, then death and Hades were thrown, where? Into the lake of fire. Well, you know what? It doesn't take anybody very smart to figure out that a lake of fire is a lake of fire. I mean, come on. You know, there are people out there that just doesn't believe that a good God of love would ever send anybody to a burning hell. Well, let me tell you, he doesn't. The Bible said that hell was made for the devil and his angels. If anyone goes to hell, they go on their own accord. They assign themselves to hellfire. Verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, that's for the saved. The book of life is your name written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what's important. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The great white throne judgment is a scary place to be found. I can't even begin to comprehend that anyone in their right mind would want to be found at a place like that, but millions and millions and billions through the ages will be there. Someone has calculated, I don't know how they came up with figure, it's probably just a guesstimation, but someone has guesstimated that since the beginning of time, maybe 100 billion people have lived upon the earth. I don't know how many there are, but I can tell you this, God knows. Let me tell you, 
The Bible says, narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Few go in the narrow way. Many go in the broad way. A lot of people worry about, is heaven going to be big enough? Yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be about 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500. And I don't think it, there'll be one iota of worry about that. But the wonderful thing, that new Jerusalem is going to eventually come down from God out of heaven and set upon the new heaven and the new earth. And we'll be able to go to and from. What a day that will be. Keith and Sharon sing. When my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, a glorious day that will be. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight. Would you stand for the benediction? Bill. Yes. Speak for thy servant heareth. When did, when did the, well, the book of Revelation was written, according to most biblical scholars, around A.D. 95. Jesus died, what, A.D. 32, 33? So you can see within 60 years, give or take a few, the book of Revelation was written. Now, through the years... Scholars have, for a lot of years, Bill, even the early church fathers spoke about it. But they, even they, would not have been able to comprehend nor understand what you and I understand tonight. Because they lived hundreds of years ago before these things that you and I see today are falling into place. Okay, anybody else? All right, God bless you. Let's bow for prayer. Father, take us home safely. Return us back on Sunday, I pray. In Christ's name, amen.